You know, we ought to be singing that song to the whole world. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. You know, normally today, if you go to the hospital, no one can sit with you in the waiting room. You're carried to a little cubicle where they determine and triage whatever may be going on. And uh, then if you're hospitalized, you go to another area. But typically, many of us prior to the pandemic would find ourselves in the waiting room. I want to talk to you tonight about God's waiting room. You know, uh, when you read the Bible, we come to an awareness that Oftentimes, we find ourselves in God's waiting room. But today, at the hospital, the seats are empty. But that's not the case with God's waiting room. There are several things about God's waiting room that I want to share with you tonight that I think that are so important. And if we can somewhat make it analogous to the waiting room down at the hospital or the doctor's office or whatever it happens to be, you will remember that there are many difficulties of the waiting room or in the waiting room. How many of you find it difficult to wait on anything? You know, most people don't like to wait, whether it's out at Walmart in line, uh, you rush over maybe to check yourself out, uh, or if you're buying uh, gas uh, for your automobile, or if you're at a, trop uh, a uh, traffic light, uh, you don't like to wait. We don't like to wait on anything. And we all pray, God, give me patience to be able to wait. Well, you and I right now, believe it or not, in God's waiting room, not the church building itself, it may be part of it, but in our world, we at large, you and I, are in the waiting room of God. And there are all kinds of difficulties. If you were in that waiting room, maybe at the hospital or at the doctor's office, you will find yourself around a lot of sick folk. Because people go to the hospital or to the doctor's office because they are sick. Now, I understand some go for wellness checkups and that sort of thing. But uh, a lot of people go because they are sick. And, uh, you know, some people wear masks, some don't. Uh, but you'll find yourself in that waiting room where people are coughing maybe and all kinds of things are, are going on. Well, in our world, and we mentioned that this morning, there are many people that are sick spiritually in our world who are having great difficulty in their life. Sometimes people in the waiting room are real sick, and there are degrees of illness. And those things uh, we have to deal with in life. One of the most famous men on earth who was extremely wealthy and... Uh, his name was Job. You remember Job from the Bible. The narrative that we call the book of Job is tremendously uh, great. It is a book about a man's patience. It was about a man who was confined to God's waiting room. He had everything in the world that he wanted. He was tremendously wealthy. And uh, God said of him that he was the greatest man in all of the East. But the time came when Job lost it all. Not only did he lose his wealth, not only did he lose his family who were killed, not only did he lose his cattle and his herds and everything about him, from his vestige of happiness and joy and wealth, he was reduced to nothing but poverty. Poverty, socially speaking, because his friends didn't think too much of Job. They thought that Job had done something to bring all of this great affliction into his life. And they're in the waiting room, believe it or not, with Job himself. He lost everything. And he was surrounded by these carnal friends who were extremely judgmental. And they kept saying unto Job, if you would just confess to God what you've done, then all of this will go away. But it doesn't happen, folks. 
Even Job's wife was one who tried to get Job to curse God and die. Well, now, that was all physical, but when you think about the spiritual world also, we know that people are spiritually ill. Some have greater problems than others, and uh, sometimes it's a tough world in which we live, and we're surrounded by all kinds of folks. In the world, however, Jesus says, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world, John 16 and verse 33. And in the book of Romans chapter 5 and 3, Paul says, And not only so, but we glory in our tribulations also, knowing that tribulation brings about patience. Nobody wants to go through tribulation. Nobody wants to go through problems. Uh, I get amazed sometimes and I hear people pray, God, give us more patience. And I think, oh, oh, wait a minute. You know, you want all that tribulation? You want all those problems that's going to bring about your patience? The book of James is one of the most profound books on Christian living there is. Uh, it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. The book of Romans certainly is one as well that details for us not only how to become a Christian, but what we do after we become one. And the book of James is so profound in what it says. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers, that means various, temptations. And the word there could more correctly be translated trials, not temptations as we know them. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect, entire, and wanting nothing. One of the toughest things that we have to do, and it was a tough thing for Job. You know, one of the interesting things about the book of Job is that we know what was going on in the very beginning. We know about the conversation that God had with the devil. And now the devil said, you know, and God says, first of all, he says to the devil, if you consider my, Job, my servant Job, there's none like him in all the world. And the devil says to God, well, wait a minute, you just think there's none like him. If you were to let me try him, I will show to you and prove to you that his faith is not as strong as you might anticipate. And so God allowed Satan to try him. And did he try him? But Job says, when I am tried, I will come forth as gold. And he did. And we read all of that. We read about all those things that happened that Job didn't know were happening. But in the end of that story and in the end of that narrative, we know that Job was blessed far and abundantly above all that he had at the very beginning. But it was a tough thing for him to learn to wait on God's timing. He prayed about it, but he was expecting an answer right now, and it did not come. You can't see what's going on in God's waiting room. You know, I tell people all the time that God is working behind the scenes. And we don't always see how God is working things out, first of all, for our good. The book of Romans 8 and verse 28 is also a tremendous passage where Paul says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are called according to his purposes. I believe that whatever happens to us as a child of God, God is working good from our adversity. And he certainly did it in Job's case. Job couldn't uh, envision what God was doing. But faith is believing God is at work even when we can't see his hand. You know, when you're in the waiting room, the doctors and the nurses are working behind the scenes. Maybe they're preparing, uh, you know, they've, they've examined you initially, and maybe they're back there working, and maybe they're calling in special doctors to, to treat whatever uh, it has to be treated. In Psalms 46, God says, be still and know that I am God. You usually do not understand what's going on in the waiting room. You sit there, I mean, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not spiritual 
or that something is terribly wrong in your life, although you may be going through some difficulty in your life. God is still working behind the scenes, and we have to trust him to do that. Sometimes we just have to wait, and we don't like to wait. How many of y'all remember Spanky McFarland? <laughs> you remember Spanky, little rascals, our gang? Yeah. Uh, sometimes we don't like to wait. We don't. But I've learned in my life that God does not operate on our calendar, nor on our clock. He has a purpose for all things. But when we're sitting in the waiting room, we are watching the clock. How many of you watch the clock when you're in the waiting room? Most of you do, don't you? I do. Sometimes I'll hit my watch and think, you know, my watch is stopped. You know, what in the world is going on here, you know? And in God's waiting room, we just have to wait. That's why it's called <laughs> a waiting room. You can't control what's going on in the waiting room. You know, I've been in the waiting room a lot of times with, with people, maybe, who were there to see the doctor, or uh, maybe they were in the hospital, and I was sitting out in the waiting room with family members, and, and uh, you know, uh, you're just out. You know, there's nothing that you can do to control what goes on. I've seen unruly kids. Uh, I've seen people get up and storm out and go up, and maybe, and curse the, the lady there at the desk because they hadn't heard something. You cannot control what goes on in the waiting room. But you have to remember that God is still in control. He is still observing. He knows exactly what is going on. But you can't control what goes on. You get sleepy. You get tired. And while you're in the waiting room and there is that place of delay, sometimes it's for an extended period of time. And we have to remember that God is never late. Sometimes, when, and when we make this analogous, uh, you know, in God's waiting room, we want God to act immediately when we pray. Have you ever noticed that? We ask God for something and, and we want an answer right then. We want that little 15-minute test that you get for coronavirus. We don't, have, we don't want to wait for three days to get the report back. We want God to act right now. But God doesn't always act when we call upon him. And we sit and we tap our watch, and we think over and over, if God really loves me, why well, he would respond to my prayer right now. <laughs> But it doesn't always happen, folks. And it doesn't make any... I'm going to tell you, you really get restless in the waiting room. And it's easy for us to get restless in God's waiting room. Especially when you're waiting maybe on someone to obey the gospel. When someone is married to a Christian and, and you wait and you wait and you hope that person will eventually obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and be baptized. You wait and you wait and sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, sometimes there are people that need to be restored in a relationship with Christ, and you wait and you wait and you wait, and you hope that they will eventually come back to God, and we just keep waiting. In the book of Romans 15 and verse 4, Paul says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures we might have hope. One of the things we have to do while we're in God's waiting room is to read the Bible. Read the Word of God. I have noticed in most waiting rooms, you know what they have? They don't have Bibles. They have a lot of magazines laying around and maybe a newspaper. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be wonderful if they had a Bible in every seat in that waiting room and maybe on the wall scriptures for those folks to look up that deal with the problems that they may be facing in life. The waiting room is usually not a very comfortable place. Uh, I've seen people so uncomfortable, and I've been uncomfortable. There is nothing like having to wait on someone in the hospital. Do you agree with that? <laughs> it is true. Uh, it's, it's most uncomfortable. And you know what? God doesn't necessarily comfort us in the waiting room. He has our attention, 
And, uh, but sometimes people go to sleep, people do all kinds of things. But the greatest truths of all are learned when we find ourselves in the dark place in life. You know, when people are going through problems, they are drawn to God more so than any other time. When things are going good and things are going great, why people feel they don't need God. But what happens is when we start facing those dismal moments in our life, in the waiting room of the Almighty, then we turn to God. We turn to God. The waiting room is often a place of worry and anxiety. How many times have you been sitting in the waiting room out at the hospital, and maybe your loved one is back, in the hospital, he's being treated, or she is, and you're worried and you're anxious about what's going on. We need to go back to what Christ said in the book of Matthew chapter 6, and not worry and not be anxious. Paul said it also when he wrote to the Philippian church, be not anxious. Worry is convinced that God does not care and that he is not able. That's not true. As I told you, God doesn't operate on our time schedule. God is able to do all things. That little phrase is found in the Bible several times. Our God is able. We sing about it, do we not? But we pace back and forth in the waiting room. We don't really trust God as that song David led a moment ago, Trust in Jesus, you know, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people carry their burdens with them, and they pack them around all day long. They carry them to bed with them, and they're so anxious and frustrated in life. But there's a second thing I want you to know. The directions for the waiting room. Now, what I mean by that, what does God, God tells us what we have to do in the waiting room. And he gave God, he gave, he gave Job directions for the waiting room. Here's what you do. How do you wait on God? How do you wait on the Lord? In the book of Isaiah chapter 40, the Bible says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And their wings shall be like those of, of eagles' wings, and they will mount up, and they will soar into the heavens. We must remember that in the waiting room, we have to obey the one who is in charge. And Job understood it. For in the early chapters of the book of Job, he says, Though the Lord slay me, I still will trust him. Would we be able to say that tonight in God's waiting room? Notice what Job says in Job 42 after he'd been through all of the great calamity that had befallen him. He says, I know that you can do everything. And I'm telling you tonight, folks, prayer should never ever be a last resort. It ought to be priority in our life. You may be going through something in your life tonight, right now, in God's waiting room that's very difficult for you to deal with. But Job says of the Father, there is none like him in all of the earth. Psalms 46.1, God is our refuge. He's active in our life. He's doing something behind the scenes. Not, God's not waiting like we wait. I mean, God is busy. He is working to give us strength. And the Bible says that he is a very present help. And that's in the present tense, isn't it? In Job 42 and verse 5, Job says, I have heard of thee. Now this is all has been said and done. I think about it. Job's going through all this, and, and God hadn't answered his prayer. I mean, you know, he hadn't responded to it in the way Job had prayed. But he's going through great calamity. And I'm going to tell you something. You may be facing something tonight, but it's not nearly as bad as Job faced. I'm not trying to minimize your problem. Don't think I am. But what I'm telling you is think about what this man went through in his life. That's why the book of Job is one of the greatest books, and it is believed to be the oldest book in the Bible. 
You know, the book of Genesis was not written for almost 25 or 2,000 years after the events took place because the patriarchal age lasted for about 2,500 years. And Moses wrote that. Factually, Moses didn't come on the scene until after that. And that's why it is believed that Job is probably the oldest book in all of the Bible. But notice what he says. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. He says, but now my eye hath seen thee. Job had been through it all right. And he'd heard about God, and so he praised to God. But he hadn't really seen the hand of God like he would like to see it. And so now, with all that God has done in blessing him, he is saying unto Job, don't you desert me in the waiting room. And let me tell you something, friend. In this life, when you are in the waiting room, and that's where you are right now, don't depart from God. Because there are greater blessings on the way. And he is working on it even as we speak. And you know what? In the waiting room is where we're most likely to hear from God. I've often said, you know, I don't believe that God speaks to us in an audible way into our ear, but I do believe he speaks to my heart. I believe he puts it in my mind and in my heart what I ought to do in life. You know, when you talk about waiting, Abraham waited 25 years after God made a promise to him that in him would all the nations of the world be blessed. Consider that. Moses waited 40 years. He's wandering out there in the wilderness with God's people, but he waited 40 years for people to enter into the promised land. And Jesus waited 30 years. You know, have you ever noticed that after the birth of Jesus, we don't have a record of anything too much that went on with the exception of when he was 12 years old and he went with his parents up to the Passover at Jerusalem. But beyond that, those 18 years of silence, we don't know what went on. But he waited 30 years years before he actually began his ministry. If God is making us wait, remember, you're in the company of your Savior and your Lord. And in Psalms 37 and verse 7, David says, Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. You know, sometimes when God acts in our life, we don't really give him the credit. Sometimes we chalk it up to luck or we chalk it up to, well, it would have happened anyway. And, you know, but would it? Job in 42, again, God does not do his deepest work in the shallowest part of our lives. We have to get alone with him. And we're, when we're alone with God, and folks, and I'm being honest with you here tonight, get alone with God and talk to the Lord and pour your heart out to God. Reflect upon him. Examine your own life. Maybe there's a time for rededication of your life to Christ and be still and wait upon God. Psalm 4610. Notice what he says. Don't just be still. Don't just wait, but know that I'm God. You know what he's saying? Hey, I'm still on the throne. I'm still in control. Don't let your hands hang down. We want to do something sometimes, but God may need us. And God is working out his schedule for us. There have been a lot of times in my life when I prayed about certain things and I had to wait on God to answer, and he didn't give me an answer right then. I didn't know what was going to happen. A lot of times in my life. But you know what I do? I just trust in God. I do what that song said a moment ago. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. 
just to take him at his word and wait on God. Because through waiting, God will teach you about his goodness. For Lamentation, that little book in the Old Testament that was written by Jeremiah, the great prophet of God, in Jeremiah 3.25, he says, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. And through your waiting on God, you are made stronger. Through your waiting, God is developing character in your life. You need to receive the blessings that he has for you. You know, that's something that a lot of us have a tendency to forget. We ask God to bless us, but we're not in a position to receive the blessings yet. God knows maybe you'd squander it. And so God is prepping you. He's developing your character. He's getting you ready for the blessing that he is going to give you, just like he did with Moses. And just like he did with Jeremiah when he was thrown in a pit and he had to wait on God to get him out. The waiting God is giving you opportunities to show your faithfulness to him. Would you be faithful to God when he doesn't immediately respond to your need or what you want? So don't waste your season of waiting. Just wait on the Lord. And that is a tough thing to do, isn't it? Wait upon the Lord, be strong, take heart, and again, wait for the Lord. Psalms 27 and verse 14. And in that time of waiting, you pray to God, communicate unto him, just, and then just be still and wait for God to speak to your heart. Just wait on him and anticipate God's Response. For in Job 42 and 10, the Bible says God called it the captivity of Job. And the Bible says, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Psalms 46, I will be exalted above the heathen, and I will be exalted above the earth. God did not leave Job in the waiting room. And I'm going to tell you, one of these days you'll come out of the waiting room, and you'll see the hand of God move in your life. One last point, and I'll do this quickly. Things you will discover in God's wedding room. Job discovered a lot of things. He discovered a new perspective, first of all. It was an opportunity for him to really get intimate with God and get close to him. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Bible says that he blessed him, that he blessed him. God gave Job that new perspective. One he would never have had had he not been in the waiting room. You know, I don't know how long he waited. I don't guess we're really privy to that in the book of Job exactly, but it had to be over an extended period of time. You think about all that happened in that man's life and all that was going on and how he had to wait. And his friends were saying, confess your sin and God will remove this plague. But it wasn't a sin problem. It was God trying his faithfulness. And you know what? Sometimes I think this pandemic may be God's way of proving our faith. And I'm afraid that the faith of some is not as strong as we presupposed. Job learned a new provision from God. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. In God's waiting room, Paul found joy, Philippians 1 verse 4. He found purpose, he found peace, he found power, and he found plenty. For the God of heaven was working in Paul's life as well. So the Bible in the book of Hebrews 6 and verse 12 says, Be not slothful of followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. That's why I don't give up. I don't give up on God. I'm going to wait. You know what? I'm, I've got faith in him. I'm patiently waiting for the promises to be fulfilled. And you know what? You don't know when the doctor will come. 
You know, when you're sitting there in that waiting room, and, and I've been there with a lot of families, and you never know exactly when that doctor is going to walk out and whether or not he's going to give you good news or bad news. You don't know whether he's going to say we've done all that we can do or that your loved one will be fine. We don't know when the doctor will come out. And you know what? In the case of Jesus, we don't know when Dr. Jesus, the great physician, will come into the waiting room and make us aware of the outcome. But I know one thing. That doctor, our Jesus, will come when the time is right. And he is always looking at our chart. He knows what we do. He knows what goes on in our life. And it's something that we have to remember. And when in the waiting room, I've trusted the doctor myself many times. I've stayed close. I've prayed, anticipating an announcement. And it finally came. You know, when our two daughters were born, the joy of their birth eclipsed all the difficulties of the waiting room. But I don't know about the delivery room. I don't know if Audrey would say that, but uh, she was giving birth to them. <laughs> but I know one thing, that the joy of having my two daughters were just beyond description tonight. Job discovered a new proximity, the nearness to God. Mine eye has seen you. The difficulties of the waiting room drove Job to the feet of God, where he discovered a nearness and an intimacy that he'd never, ever imagined. So please remember tonight that you are in the waiting room of God. Trust him, stay close, be still. Yield to his plan and be ready to view some great discoveries in days to come. We don't always understand why bad things happen, but I know one thing, that most of the time good things come from bad things because God can turn it around. Let me ask you a question tonight, and just maybe you are. Why are you waiting Jesus is ready to save your soul. Why do you wait? Are you waiting on God or is God waiting on you? Anticipate that question while we stand and while we sing. <laughs>